What is Serial Experiments Lane? Like, what is it really about? Like, really, though? It is an anime that has a rather unique reputation in anime circles around the internet. It's often lauded as a prophetic masterpiece that foresaw the domination of the internet and digital mediums of communication over our lives and provided us with a logically confusing and yet emotionally resonant representation of life after the internet. The Wired is just the internet, and Chaikike Kanaka was literally Jesus who predicted the internet before the internet even existed, and now we have all become this socially isolated 14 year old girl who's also God apparently. This is pretty much the general consensus regarding the anime. Of course there are other ideas such as identity and religion that are being explored in the show, at least I think so, because many people have written thousands of words trying to understand what the show is trying to say about them. Curiously enough, recently I came upon a similar culturally significant piece of media that also wears the badge of being a prophecy that tackled subject matter long before that very subject matter took on the mantle of global importance. I'm of course talking about Hideo Kojima's 2001 release, Metal Gear Solid 2, A Fils de Liberté. The ending of that game is also widely lauded as a prediction of the domination of the internet and digital mediums of communication of our lives. Weird scary AI, fake news distorting public perception, highly hidden and classified forms of censorship and forces that create context so as to control people? Why that's just literally like right now! This game predicted everything, it even predicted how women doing science leads to bad things happening. Of course that's something yet to happen but it did predict all the other stuff. Wow, misogyny? Oh well at least she's a character who gets to have an independent and fulfilling role and is not just killed off to give the main male character an emotional arc. Well it's Kojima right? Nobody's perfect. Anyways, while I appreciate the love and care these pieces of media receive whenever they're celebrated to be these prophecies for the digital world and while I do agree that indeed they are incredibly potent as a reflection of what the world has become decades after their release, the sentiment that is, it's just the internet, I think it inadvertently works to limit and obscure a much more complex yet insightful examination that is present within these works concerning something beyond just the internet or the age of digital communication. And to kick it all off, I'd like to start by going over our first focus of interest, Serial Experiments Lane. So. For the uninitiated, part 1, The Yuppies Network King. Well, Serial Experiments Lane is a 1998 anime following the dilly dallyings of Iwakura Lane, a 14 year old junior high school girl and quintessential reddit dweller who slowly but surely submerges herself into The Wired, the show's name for a world wide web of computers through which people exchange information, or in other words, the internet. It's a little hard to convey any more information about the plot of the show because the show is very surreal. It is very much that show that every pretentious person ever will have as one of their favorites of all time near a 5 hour Tarkovsky film. It is very art house and very avant garde. Regardless, the crux of the story is that basically the girl Lane goes through a massive identity crisis which crescendos with her either erasing herself from the world and slash or the wired which may simultaneously be the world and also becomes god. Anyways, as you can infer from how I am unable to concretely describe the events of the show, it is an anime that has a reputation of being something that needs to be analyzed and interpreted to reach the hidden true meaning that it wants to convey. A message that is widely believed to have something to do with life on the internet because the wired is just the internet. Anyways, as I am unable to do a good job at describing the show, let's turn our eyeballs towards the disembodied mouths on the internet, how ironic indeed to see what this anime is all about. 
Here's what I under. Lane was just a program, but that weird Jojo type of guy gave her a body. Now that she was in the world, even though she was not supposed to, everything went wrong, people died and shit. Uh, in the end, she deleted herself from everyone's memory. Now everyone's back to normal. Lane's exploration into the Wired brings her face to face with the complexities of human emotions and relationships. She grapples with the concepts of love, both in the digital realm and the physical world, as she she navigates through the intricacies of her own feelings and those of others. Meanwhile, tensions escalate among Lane's classmates as they confront the consequences of their involvement with the Wired and struggle to come to terms with their own desires and vulnerabilities. As Lane delves deeper into the mysteries surrounding the network, she begins to uncover hidden truths about the nature of consciousness and the interconnections of all things. Through her journey, Lane is forced to confront her own fears and doubts, ultimately leading her to a profound understanding of the true nature of love and the power it holds to transcend the boundaries of time and space. If you really think about it, this was all because of Lane. She made this happen. but. If you think about it, she just exists now. Therefore, she made a eternal dimension to where she is a mere child, that of to which of what she was in her anime dimension, making her anti-existent atoms practically make her be one with nothing. And it really amazes how that they thought of this whoever wrote has to have been a soul from a different molecule type of matter, which proves that they are also like Lane, in a state where they are able to be there in someone else's vision, all because they used to know that individual just like Lane. It's honestly crazy how she's just like, basically, she's in motion along with all those who she has conned near her G's. I give this anime a good 9.5 out of 10, just because it was confusing at some parts. I still feel bad for Lane though. Correction. Connected. Well, you already know where this is going. I showed you these very enlightening interpretations so that I can say, move over and let the real masters do their thing. And give you my clever new analysis of serial experiments, Lane. Wires occupy the majority of the iconography of serial experiments lane. Whether it be the static shots of the cluttered power lines in Lane's neighborhood, the computer wires that slowly develop in quantity and intensity over the course of Lane's descent into the wire, maybe even an ascent depending upon the way you choose to approach it, and the very name that is given to the web of communications and information, the wired. The show's structure resembles a spiral. Each episode and each scene pushes the concepts and the imagery that it established to a new and more complex level. At the beginning, Lane's room is eerily empty. Aside from a table, a bed, and a few plushies, her room has nothing that adds character to it by itself. It resembles any room ever. The aforementioned wire imagery is borderline non-existent, with her kid Navi being totally wireless. The only thing coming close to a wire inside her room being the shadows formed by the power lines outside upon being hit by the streetlights. A mere shadow of a wire, a signifier of a signifier of connection. By episode 2, her new and highly capable Navi arrives at her doorstep and by episode 3, it settles itself within her room. By episode 4, the growing presence of physical and no longer unremarkable wires is made clear to us. This continues until her room no longer resembles a room, any room for that matter. The wires and the technology gradually over the course of the rest of the episodes take on the behavior of a creature of flesh secreting liquids, growing veins and slowly consuming Lane herself. I say spiral-like structure and not a linear one because the concepts and imagery that Serial Experiments Lane confronts us with are sporadic and confusing. Often looking back on these same questions and concepts that were previously tackled now from a more complex position with a larger context. Take this piece of written text that pops up on screen, possibly signifying a message sent over the wired that reads, why you should do it is something you should figure out for yourself. Right before Chisa Yamoda jumps off a building, taking her own life. 
This statement is one that grasps within its clutches the very essence of the entire show. Firstly, it conveys the core of the mystery that surrounds the first few episodes, that being the death of Lane's classmate, Chisa. Why did she kill herself? And if she is dead, how is she emailing people? Secondly, and more crucially, it is the significance of the I. Why you should do it is something you should figure out for yourself. Subjecthood or the significance of the self is what is highlighted in the statement. As the show progresses, the true nature of it, of subjectivity, will be made clear. Thirdly, there is a mysticism surrounding Chisa's death. She did it for a reason, a reason that becomes clearer and yet more confusing as the show progresses. God is here, is what Cheese's email read when Lane asks her why she did it. God? Here? What does she mean by God? Where is she talking from? Again, as the episodes pass on, we get more information surrounding these questions. We basically see this God. We see this here, the faceless bodies, floating mouths, dark voids, or at least that's what one could say here referred to, but still, things get more befuddling, because again, what exactly are these faceless bodies, the floating mouths in the dark void? What is this god's deal? Hell, what does this god even mean? Is it god the sole creator of all life? Is it god the omnipotent, omnipresent, and omniscient? Or is this god supposed to be some kind of concept, like how Spinoza characterizes god as a unified nature which is capable of independent existence? Certain episodes contain our main character having conversations about these very concepts. In the first few episodes, Lane's father is rather encouraging of his daughter's venture into the Wired, speaking about how the Wired is a medium through which people can connect meaningfully with different individuals across the world. Lane, you are in junior high now already. Your school chums must be leaving you in the technical dust. We should upgrade that old Navi. You know, Lane. In the real world, or the wired world, people are connected somehow. That's how societies are created. In episode 2, the concept of the wired is taken to another contextual level, where a deranged shooter who confronts Lane at a nightclub frantically exclaims that the real world and the wired should be kept separate. Leave me out of it! The wired can never interfere with the real world! Just leave me out of it! Will you? Who the hell are you? Lane creepily responds with... No matter where you are, everyone is always connected. The concept of connection is twisted to fit a different mold here as compared to its less unnerving apparition with her father. Then this same topic returns in episode 3 where her dad says, I think that my little girl perhaps has become obsessed with the Wired. It's just an advanced medium for communication. Don't ever get it confused with the real world. To which Lane, even more creepily, like she's two hours into a seven-year-old's TikTok page or something, retorts, You're wrong. The border between the two isn't so clear. And then, in the following episodes, as Lane pretty much loses herself in the wired, this subject is brought up again in the form of discussions between Lane and floating cyber ghosts and avatars, which changed the concept to the wired is an upper layer of reality formed atop of the real world to, by the end, where the line between them completely breaks down absolutely. Similarly, as the definitions of the wired and connections change throughout the show, our protagonist Lane herself changes. In the beginning, even before she begins to interact directly with the wired, we are shown surreal visions being experienced by Lane, such as a ghostly high school girl haunting her through her school corridor getting hit by a speeding train and weird white wire things coming out of Lane's fingertips. But crucially, Lane herself is shown to be intact. Her personality, her character remains that of a timid and quiet schoolgirl. We experience this wacky imagery from her perspective, which remains concrete and thus, 
she becomes a solid cornerstone to orient our understanding of what's real and whom to believe in the show. But as she journeys further into the Wired and as what the Wired is changes in the show, Lane herself begins to embody the wackiness. There are two lanes now, one timid, the other girl boss, but wait, the timid one's also girl boss sometimes, and oh wait, she's simply not timid anymore and now she's just weird. Weird? Wired? Lane's perspective as the show progresses no longer stays concrete. We can no longer trust her for being a signifier of reality, as of course the definition of reality within the show is undergoing change alongside her. This is what I mean by a spiral, a disorientating and often overwhelming vortex of words and images that never, not even for a second, stops to give the viewer time to reflect or reorient themselves. Disorientating and overwhelming, yes, but crucially not random. What the show sets out to do from the very beginning, the concepts it uses, the imagery, all remain consistent throughout, if only undergoing change as the show progresses. Serial Experiments Lane contains all the common anime motifs and tropes that are unique to the medium, but it uses them to further make the audience feel out of place. Lane is a junior high school girl who, for a significant chunk of the show, wears her school uniform. We've seen junior high and high school anime main characters, and we've seen the school setting countless amounts of times before in anime. But there's something off about them in Serial Experiments Lane. Lane's uniform is not the usual pretty looking type, instead it is realistic and square. Her school is not the usual warm-toned archetypal anime school, it's clinical and cold. I've already talked about Lane's room not resembling a schoolgirl's room, but her house as a whole feels oddly impersonal. The scenes with her family are suffocating, every action made by the parents or her sister feels cold and unnatural. A total 180 degree from say the family of Yukino Miyazawa from Gainax's rom-com Kare Kano that aired only a few months after Seal Experiments Lane ended. Miyazawa's family is insanely warm and comforting, both in their color schemes and their personalities. The family is loud and often makes fun of each other. But here, Lane's family resembles the unnaturally surreal family of David Lynch's rabbits than it does Miyazawa's family. All of this, of course, not even mentioning the art style. The characters are not cute in the anime sense, their proportions are more or less realistic. Facial details, like the lip flap, that usually goes ignored by cute anime art styles, is retained here often creating these imposing, ugly portraits of characters. Similarly, there are certain actions that the characters in Lane do that resemble something that we already know, but ultimately end up feeling alien and strange. In episode 3, there is an early scene where Lane is taken in by the police as a witness after the aforementioned shooting at the club. Arise, Lane's friend from school who is responsible for inviting Lane to the club, runs over to her, places her hand on top of Lane's, and apologizes for getting her in trouble. This is a gesture, an expression of regret. She is begging Lane for forgiveness. Of course, not in a dramatic or theatrical way, as you see this all the time, not just in anime, but in real life as well. But how does Lane react? She utters, <laughs> Even after Arisu leaves teary-eyed, Lane repeats her name in a similar fashion, peering down at her own hands where Arisu's hands used to be. <laughs> what does this mean? In episode 12, Arisa and Lane have another peculiar interaction that resembles a common dramatic gesture, but with something off. Arisa puts Lane's hands on top of her chest as a way to prove her existence as real due to her physicality. 
her beating heart and warmth is proof that she's real and that reality exists outside the bodily world of the Wired. But again, the scene ends with Masami Eiri, who is, as we are led to believe, God, who should be a cyber apparition covering himself with some kind of flesh that takes utterly hideous forms while Lane does her weird talk no jutsu while holding a trembling Arisu beside her. While the sapphic undertones are quite readable, to say that this scene means this or that, I think, still leaves other aspects of the scene neglected. Just like the previous scene, the gesture in this scene too comes off feeling as a mere signifier of a signifier of something meaningful. The act of putting your hands on someone's chest to feel their beating heart instead of directly meaning something here ends up feeling like it wants to reference something that means something. And what is this meaning? Well, it could be a lot of things, just like how the interpretations that I showed you at the beginning of this part, it could be emphasizing the power of love and human connection, or it could be doing the opposite, instead pointing to the futility of human connection as both scenes end with Lane not really feeling connected to Arisu, with the second scene finding its ending in the next episode where Arisu no longer feels safe with Lane. It could be a heartwarming scene of someone lost in the unreality of the wire to finally being able to be intimate with another person, or on the contrary, it could be a deeply saddening scene of someone lost in the internet, being unable to connect to another person meaningfully due to how far they've gone. Or it could be what it seems to be. Love! Lane is gay! Part 2.1 Unborn Chicken Voices in My Head November 2001 saw the release of Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, the second installment of Hideo Kojima, the golden boy of video games series Metal Gear Solid, excluding the earlier 2D Metal Gear games. To say that this game was something would be an understatement quite literally. Whenever this game comes up in discussion, there are more or less two aspects of it that people massively focus on. The first is the interesting story behind its main character. For those of you who are not in the know, like literally why are you not in the know, it's so warm and comfortable in here. The original Metal Gear Solid, which coincidentally released in September 1998, the same month as the one in which Lane's finished airing. Coincidence? I think so, yeah. The original Metal Gear Solid followed the super spy man, espionage man guy, Solid Snake, infiltrating an Alaskan nuclear weapons disposal facility codenamed Shadow Moses, and trying to defeat a huge mecha that's capable of nuclear destruction called Metal Gear, and also deal with his clone brother, Liquid Snake. With its silly but charming little characters, moments of genuine thoughtful reflection, and clever video game mechanics that took advantage of its medium, Metal Gear Solid received an all-around critical acclaim. Forwarding three years, players were more than looking forward to jumping back into the shoes of the legendary hero Solid Snake. The trailers, posters, advertisements, and all other promotional materials showed off our adorable slithery fellow in his new and improved graphics model. And then the game came out. The players jumped right onto the tanker mission alongside Solid Snake, then they took a few photos of a new Metal Gear threat, now as extra legal actors alongside everybody's favorite otaku convention, and then loaded the second mission, and… well, Kojima had tricked them. The legendary hero of Shadow Moses, Solid Snake, is no longer the main character of Metal Gear Solid even if you wanted him to be. Instead, it's this beta cuck soy boy Raiden, a completely new character. This indeed left fans dumbfounded, kinda similar to how Raiden himself and even Solid Snake in the previous games were made to deal with situations to which they were not given sufficient information for. Hideo Kojima once again made his gambit, disregarding all walls of artistic consumption, and won. 
The other aspect that is often fixated upon while talking about this game is its remarkable ending. Instead of a more traditional and conclusive ending where you fist fight the gene obsessed villain and deliver a soliloquy about how genes don't have to define our lives just before jet skiing into the horizon with your girl or boy depending on the ending you get, Wyden is treated with a brain shattering multiple minute long exposition by an AI named George Washington. That's right, it's AI and it's here to eat your kids. Except your kids are not real because you're not real because we live in a society. Throughout the game, you feel Wyden's helplessness as he's led from one strut to another by vague, underexplained objectives that complicate the story that we try and piece together. The Big Shell, an offshore cleaning facility where the game takes place, is basically two giant hexagons, each corner of which being called a strut. In the first half, you are made to circle around each of the struts to defuse bombs, not to mention that you would, anyhow throughout the course of the game, circle around multiple times nevertheless while exploring. You, in the shoes of Raiden, are emasculated as compared to Snake from the previous game who, although also was sent into his mission with only half the information, still maintained a sense of badassery that he accumulated from the 2D Metal Gear games. Wyden is not so. He is a donkey being led on by a carrot on a stick. And in fact, so are we, as Snake, now disguised as Pliskin, is right there, just far away enough from the player's grasps of control. Of course, all of this is deliberate, because all of this, the mission, the setting, the characters, all of it had been a carefully calculated plan in order to mold Widen into another solid snake, with the masterminds behind it all being the Patriots, or the La Le Lu Le Lo, a group of 12 individuals who basically control the world. Kojima, as the mischievous little man he is, weaves in the story of subtle indoctrination into the metatextual level of his game. You, the player yourself, are being molded into what Wyden is being molded into alongside him. Throughout the game, you, along with Wyden, want to be Solid Snake, seek his legendary skills and status, and wish to feel as powerful as he is. Wyden was a child soldier made to kill from a very young age. You, at least the average player who played Sons of Liberty, most likely grew up playing violent video games themselves. Wyden experienced the Shadow Moses incident through VR missions as a part of his training, and you, experience the Shadow Moses incident by playing the first game. If Raiden is a lab rat, so are you. Who's lab rat? Well, at first we have a reason to believe that the Patriots are the enemy behind it all. After all, they did orchestrate this entire thing, meticulously constructing a set of missions that closely resemble the events that took place in Shadow Moses. Four diverse main enemies, anonymous and enigmatic cyborg ninja, a suspicious Colonel Campbell, and so on. But as the AI explains, You exercise your right to freedom, and this is the result. All rhetoric to avoid conflict and protect each other from hurt. The untested truths, spun by different interests, continue to churn and accumulate in the sandbox of political correctness and value systems. Everyone withdraws into their own small gated community, afraid of a larger forum. They stay inside their little ponds, leaking whatever truth suits them into the growing cesspool of society at large. The different cardinal truths neither clash nor mesh. No one is invalidated, but nobody is right. Not even natural selection can take place here. The world is being engulfed in truth. What we had gathered as truth, the real story behind the happenings, was not true at all. Well, no. Rather, it is true, except it's among many truths. The reason behind this entire experiment is left ambiguous. Perhaps there is no reason. Or more likely, the reason does not matter at all. Within the context of Metal Gear Solid 2, the Patriots might as well be any other conspiracy theory-esque group of rich and powerful people. In fact, 
Although it is retconned to be something completely different in the following games, in the post credit scene of this game, we hear Otakon confirming that these patriots were confirmed dead over a hundred years ago. They're already dead. All twelve of them. When did it happen? Well, uh, about a hundred years ago. What the AI is talking about is post-truth. A world where a public central capital T truth has disappeared into smaller bubbles of beliefs. A disorientating and restless society that defines itself as a collection of isolated and alienated individuals who tolerate each other endlessly. A world where the objective has dissolved into the subjective, and the subjective has dissolved into particularity and the arbitrary. Part 2.2 God Loves His Children In the 16th century, the astronomer and mathematician Copernicus came out with his revolutionary discovery that completely altered the world's perception of itself. The Earth, and by extension humanity, God's dear creations were not the center of the universe, he discovered. Instead, the Earth, we, were the ones rotating around the sun like the chumps we are. The backlash that Copernicus and his followers experienced is rather well known. The church, invariably, did not like this notion that went against the scriptures, and anyone who held their position in favor of the Copernican doctrine were pursued and punished, with lots of them being infamously burnt at the stakes. Often brought up to demonstrate the superiority of the scientific method or why we should always keep an open mind as we very well could be like all those who believed that the universe revolved around us, the story of the Copernican Revolution is a mainstay in the history of science. But what I'd like to draw attention to by bringing it up here is something different. Why did the public react so viscerally to this discovery? Yes, faith is an answer, it has been a creator of fervor, but to take the path of Reddit atheists would be, as it always is, a highly short-sighted move. You see, the Copernican Revolution was perhaps an early occurrence, a glimmer of a larger movement, a shift in how we view the world. About a century later, Europe would enter the Enlightenment, a key period in the history of, well, everything, where faith, the church, and feelings were shoved aside and reason and science were now thrown as the forces that would illuminate a bright future. That's not to say that the church and religion became obsolete, far from it, as Enlightenment philosophers like John Locke and Rousseau were notably influenced by religious ideas such as the liberal notion of the human being, that is, that every human being is intrinsically equal as God created us all. Regardless, the Enlightenment resulted in a shift, a detachment of sorts, from a cultural center. God was no longer the supreme voice of morality that would guide you to salvation. The church no longer spoke the truth. God was dead and we had killed him. How shall we comfort ourselves, the murderers of all? Settle down there, emo philosopher man. However, this decentration was not a complete displacement. People, although they lost the very base of their entire worldview, we're not left to fall forever into an epistemological abyss as of course this was the age of reason. Reason flew in to catch them all, to answer all their questions and fly them to a better tomorrow. Except it did not. Science ended up asking more questions than it gave answers, and the times it did give answers, things did not progress like how they all thought it would. An accumulation of knowledge now accelerated by science did not automatically lead to a better society. Science led to progress, yes, but it also led to warfare, torture, bombs, concentration camps, genocides, threat of complete and utter destruction. We killed God using science and, in turn, tainted it with blood, and the center that we thought would replace the old one crumbled. 
We fell. The abyss stared back. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. This was the world of the modern. A new generation of humans who were led astray, who had lost their center and were desperately searching for a way back. Exhausting fragmentation of experience and thought, desperately looking for a way back to understanding, haunted the literature of modernists such as T.S. Eliot and Franz Kafka. Modernist philosophers clinged to logic and reasoning to perhaps logic their way back to a moral and epistemological center. Workers around the globe saw an imposter crawl in and try to play the center in the form of the factory under monopolistic capitalism. We needed our dear center back, and we needed it back now, but it never came. Postmodernism, boast, boast? <laughs> Postmodernism, both being an extension of this modern condition that I just detailed, and also a counter, a denunciation of it, is the condition that characterizes present day life under what most call late stage capitalism. In a world dominated by multinational corporations that bridge gaps between cultures, or perhaps a better way to put it is that force all cultures into a blender and vomit out a smoothie of commodities. We have stopped looking for a cultural center. There is no god anymore, and nor is there a global trust in an imminent virtue of scientific development to orient our societal attitude towards. There is no hole in the postmodern world, no totality. Postmodernist philosopher Jean Francois Lyotard, one of the first to identify and theorize about this condition, said that postmodernism, in the simplest of terms, was an incredulity towards grand narratives. The modernist writers and thinkers built systems and based their entire worldview around a unified central general idea of how things worked. This unified center, whether that be Spinoza's nature, Hegel's idea of reason and Geist, Marx's class struggle, or even how modernist writers wrote from a perspective of experiencing a loss of center, is what Leotard called a grand narrative. Narrativization was essential for modern thought. Even science and scientific progress had to be supported using a meta-narrative postulated by the liberal Enlightenment thinkers and even Hegel with how he posited that as the world spirit became more conscious of itself, it would free itself. And that is, as more knowledge about the universe we acquired, the freer we became. Postmodernism was skeptical of this. This can be seen in how postmodernist thinkers like Michael Foucault, Jean Baudelaire, and Jacques Derrida, instead of positing a wide system or narrative as the backbone of their societal analysis, they rather worked on analyzing particular aspects of human life. Foucault did not posit any singular notion of class or culture that would explain why and how the institutions of psychiatry is being used to oppress us. Deleuze and Guattari criticized Freud's focus on the Oedipus complex and how he views every psychological condition as being tied back down to it. They proposed that something new should occur. Instead of a singular tree with multiple strands sprawling out, they said that we should look at the world as a continuous non-linear series of roots like that of a rhizomes. Instead of a because and a therefore that formed a vertical hierarchical tree, they proposed a perpetual end. This individual living in this postmodern condition no longer had a central truth to orient their understanding of the world around. This individual was no longer even a subject. Instead of a modernist narrative of the self existing, in this new postmodern world where all cultures and all communities are forced to exist in a perpetual state of indefinite tolerance, where each person's ideas about how the world works is treated just as correct as the others was seen as obsolete. The self was decimated. Does something like a self exist inside of you? That which you call self 
serves as nothing more than a mask to cover your own being. In this era of ready-made truths, self is just something used to preserve those positive emotions that you occasionally feel. Another possibility is that self is a concept you conveniently borrowed under the logic that would endow you with some sense of strength. That's crap! Is it? Would you prefer that someone else tell you? All right, then. Explain it to him. Jack, you're simply the best, and you got there all by yourself. Oh, what happened? Do you feel lost? Why not try a bit of soul-searching? Don't think you'll find anything, though. Ironic that although self is something that you yourself fashion, every time something goes wrong, you turn around and place the blame on something else. It's not my fault. It's not your fault. In denial, you simply resort to looking for another, more convenient truth in order to make yourself feel better. Leaving behind in an instant the so-called truth you once embraced. Should someone like that be able to decide what is truth? Should someone like you even have the right to decide? You've done nothing but abuse your freedom. You don't deserve to be free. If freedom was one of the grand narratives that dominated modernist thinking, postmodernists have come to the realization that freedom is not something that we ever really had. After all, the self is something that is given to the human from the outside, something created. These outside forces not only control us, but also create us, thereby making the term freedom meaningless. Look at Lacan's idea of the ideal ego and the ego ideal. Everyone has an ideal ego, a perfect version of ourselves. However, we also have the ego ideal situated in the symbolic order, that is, we are only made ourselves because the higher forces of power such as our family, friends, society, the state and so on perceive us. Even a freedom from these forces, a greater control over our lives are looked upon with a skeptical eye by the postmodernists. As the AI blurts out, all this freedom has caused is a saturation of truths, of innumerable different subjective realities that further obscure the real truth, assuming such a thing even exists. Life under postmodernity is inherently alienating. Without a truth to center our understanding of the world, we are made to roam the world, experiencing day after day as passive individuals caught in a flurry of sensations. As a cultural center breaks down, a narrative of society, of a collectivity that is larger than the sum of its parts, also breaks down. If Aristotle posited society as what makes us human when he said that man is by nature a political animal and that the animal is made human when they enter a politis, a communion with other humans, then the being experiencing the postmodern world is more animal than man. Because the society in the postmodern world is no greater than a collection of individuals. So it's kind of like entering different cyberspaces in the wired from serial experiments lane, except we're all lane. Wait, oh, oh, to, to shit, too, too soon. I have some other stuff to first get through. Fuck! Language is something that is essential to the Metal Gear Solid series. Part 2.3, with your opinion which is of no consequence at all. Like, seriously, the games are notorious for their overly lengthy cutscenes and codec call sequences that are insanely wordy. In Sons of Liberty, codec calls are the primary vehicle through which important information about the plot is conveyed. In fact, each long codec call sequence can be used as a section endpoint for the story, if we decide to split it into sections. Finding Snake disguised as Pliskin, then finding Stillman and learning about the bombs as well as the first member of the villain group named Fat Man. Then, after the first fight with Solid Snake, who is the other clone brother of Solid Snake, if you don't know, just don't worry about it. We are made to find Ames, a secret agent who gives us more insight into the nature of the situations that's happening in the big shell through a lengthy codec call. 
And afterwards, we find President Johnson, who, after groping Raiden, which I still don't know how to process, gives us a lengthy explanation into the mission and introduces us to the Patriots, again, through a lengthy codec call. Then there is Emma Emmerich, Otakon's sister, with whom we again use the codec system to communicate with. All this, not even going over how the ending sequence, the most iconic section of the game, is almost entirely composed of yapping. Both the AI to Raiden and after the final boss battle with Solidus, with Snake to Raiden. Similarly, labels and names are important to the game as well. One of the first things Raiden experiences as a part of this mission is his name being changed from Snake to Raiden by Colonel Campbell. And one of the first attempts at a joke by Raiden is There's a terminal in front of the elevator, a node. Did you say nerd? Not nerd, node. Oh. Language. Not a particular language like English or French, but the very phenomenon is of high significance in the series. This is interesting because what is language? Common sense tells us that it is a system of sounds and symbols that people use to communicate their thoughts and feelings to other people. But the problem with that understanding of language is that it views language as a neutral tool that we merely utilize to communicate. The late 19th century linguist Ferdinand de Saussure observed that words are arbitrary. What he meant was that the unmotivated signs, that is the sounds that we make to refer to a thing or a feeling or a concept, or the symbols that we put on paper, or even the gestures that we make with our bodies, don't have any internal connection with the things they are signifying. For instance, the word rations that Sons of Liberty uses to signify the in-game object that restores Wyden's health does not really have any connection with the object itself, except for the fact that we use it to refer to it. It could have been called a PSG or a chaff grenade or an otaku convention. There is nothing in the object itself that ties it to the word ration. We simply call it because, well, we don't call it anything else. It is completely arbitrary. And the same applies to everything else in existence. The word firework and the word microphone could have exchanged the objects which they signify and the world would go on the same as it is now. I just refer to this as me holding a firework and singing Katy Perry's popular song, Microphone. Microphone. In other words, language is a system of empty signifiers that doesn't really mean anything by itself. It only remains consistent and not ridiculous because it is relational. Every signifier, every word signifies what it does because every other word signifies what they do. Now, Saussure took these observations to finally posit that instead of language being a tool, an uncaring vehicle to communicate meaning that exists in the world, language itself creates meaning. Instead of language being a way to understand the world, Language constitutes the world. Snake is a legend, a hero to widen, but he's also a murderer, a terrorist. These labels don't mean the same thing, even meaning opposite things, although we are using them to describe the same person. These labels, language, creates what this person is to us. This is the base of what is called Structuralism, a school of literary and cultural theory that strictly splits away with older liberal methods of analysis which presuppose a true message within every text. But that's not where we're stopping. Post-structuralism, an extension as well as a counter-movement towards structuralism as a similar kind of relationship between modernism and postmodernism, 
actually fully internalizes what language constitutes our world really means. If language, the categories, symbols, and other signifiers that we use to understand the world is actually what our world ends up being, then there isn't really an objective and real world, is there? Thus, reflecting the postmodernist condition of decentration, the post-structural worldview realizes that there isn't anything actually out there outside of what we say is out there. As the post-structuralist philosopher Derrida says, there is nothing outside the text. The text, language, is all there is. Taken in this light, the true nature of Sons of Liberty's ending becomes clear. The Patriots, otherwise known as Lali Lule Lo, it's so fun to say, a literal group of vowels is the assumed mastermind behind it all. Except they don't really exist. They are whatever you want them to be. Their existence merely signifies the paranoia of a secret group of individuals deceiving the world and controlling society, whilst in actuality the world itself is a mere collection of human-made contexts. The GW, George Washington AI thing, claims itself to have been born out as an upper layer of the White House as a conglomeration of the original American values. To begin with, we're not what you'd call human. Over the past 200 years, a kind of consciousness formed layer by layer in the crucible of the White House. It's not unlike the way life started in the oceans four billion years ago. The White House was our primordial soup, a base of evolution. We are formless. We are the very discipline and morality that Americans invoke so often. How can anyone hope to eliminate us? As long as this nation exists, so will we. In this sense, though GW recognizes the postmodern situation of a loss of truth and meaning in the world, it seeks to control people to create the convenient context that would lead people to live with the discipline and civility. Thus, when it says that the world has become a collection of isolated bubbles of people with their own truths, it does not merely refer to the internet, but life both in and outside the internet as well. The GW isn't just using social media to control popular narrative. What it wants to do is re-centralize this decentered world. This is why the Patriots are painted as a super secret organization that controls the world. They aren't really, but believing in this narrative is what allows GW to manipulate Wyden into doing their bidding. The GW wants to reinstate a central grand narrative that would recenter the world. In turn, Snake and Raiden are the postmodernists who reject the idea of a center. As Snake says, There's no such thing in the world as absolute reality. Most of what they call real is actually fiction. What you think you see is only as real as your brain tells you it is. Then, what am I supposed to believe in? What am I going to leave behind when I'm through? We can tell other people about having faith. What we had faith in. What we found important enough to fight for. It's not whether you are right or wrong, but how much faith you were willing to have. That decides the future. The Patriots are a kind of ongoing fiction too, come to think of it. Listen, don't obsess over words so much. Find the meaning behind the words, then decide. You can find your own name, and your own future. Decide for myself? And whatever you choose will be you. Snake and Raiden confront this decentered, post-truth, post-grand narrative world and accept it. Hence why Snake emphasizes the importance of personal, individual faith in deciding what truth is. Don't obsess over words so much, he says. He realizes that they are arbitrary and they don't really reflect an underlying meaning. Hence why, after telling Wyden to find meaning behind the words, Snake tells him to decide for himself what he is and what his future is going to be. In other words, their meaning is about as meaningless as the world is. 
they are shallow. They hold no inherent deep meaning within them. So we graft our own meanings into them and live out our lives the best we can. Sons of Liberty is Kojima's acknowledgement of postmodern thought, with an asterisk which we'll get into later. In Metal Gear Solid, he dismantled the grand narrative of genes through Snake and Liquid, its ending sequence literally being Kojima telling the player to not fuss over genes and destiny so much. You mustn't allow yourself to be chained to fate, to be ruled by your genes. Humans can choose the type of life they want to live. The important thing is that you choose life and then live. Can love bloom even on a battlefield? Snake can only answer with yes if he tackles the meta-narrative of hero and villain or enemy and ally. They're of course meta-narratives that function to support systems of oppression. And now in Sons of Liberty, Kojima attacks the meta-narrative of objectivity and absolute reality. He shows us how systems of oppression use this meta-narrative to control us with the GW and whatever the fuck Lolly Lo eventually gets retcon into being in the following Metal Gear games. Both in MGS1 and Sons of Liberty, an overcoming of the paternal antagonism is a prevalent motif. Snake is a genetic clone of Big Boss. Liquid 2 is another clone of Big Boss, just as Snake is, and in MGS1, Liquid acts as an embodied reminder of Big Boss's presence in Snake's life. But of course, Snake defeats Liquid, rejecting the edible antagonism with his father figure. Similarly, Sons of Liberty's ending has Raiden defeat Solidus, a paternal figure to Raiden, even though Solidus' real motives may even have been something Raiden himself would have agreed with. Remember, the Oedipus Complex is interpreted as a meta-narrative underlying Freudian psychoanalytic theory. Decentration can be seen in most aspects of Sons of Liberty. Take for instance the primary villain group. There is a vampire. His name is Vamp. Vampire named Vamp. He can, he can run on water, he can run vertically, and there isn't really an in-universe explanation for either of these. Then there's Fortune, who cannot die because as her name suggests, she has her luck stat maxed out. Bullets swerve past her and grenades stop working when thrown at her. We are given an explanation for this as Liquid Ocelot reveals that he had planted some kind of nanomachine device on her that does all the bullet deflection, and yet in her final scene, once she's off of the nanomachines that are supposed to protect her, she still manages to conjure up some kind of magic power that protects her and all the other characters from a rain of missiles. And as far as this game is concerned, there is no explanation for this or the vampire named Vamp. They are all surfaces. They are simple images that don't mean anything. Postmodernity believes that signs and images exist by themselves. What are these spectacular images if not these independent and depthless signs? These signs, the web of ultimately depthless and meaningless signifiers, a flurry of images, is what we experience living in a digital postmodern world. Part 3. The Panic, the Vomit, the Panic, the Vomit. You know why video essayists wait till the middle of their video to talk about their personal life that they feel is relevant to the subject of the essay? It's due to the fear that people might click off if they begin with a personal anecdote. Whoa! Attention, retention, buddy! What are you doing talking about your personal character failings? Anyways, I've always considered myself to have been a product of the internet. I grew up on the internet, spending my formative years indoors, exploring niche gaming and horror communities, watching Let's Plays, reading creepy pastas, eventually entering Twitter and Discord, lurking in the most random of servers and so on. Although I'm not as bad as the kids nowadays, oh, I'm sure every generation of people ever have said that, my internet adventures began around the age of 10 or 11 and amplified when my family shifted houses during my early teens, leaving behind pretty much all the people my age I had known at the time. 
The 2020 pandemic, alongside the house shifting, led to pretty much most of my early teens being spent within the web. I vividly remember getting up late, attending a few online classes, by which of course I mean goofing around in Discord servers while muting the Google Meet tab and waiting for the last period to get over so I can play some video games. Some of my favorite pieces of media like Dark Souls, Breath of the Wild, Evangelion, and countless movies are stuff that I experienced within this time frame. Moreover, it is also within this time frame when I got into theory and literature and started to listen to lectures and video essays. So I think it's clear when I say I am a product of the internet. I do not know who I would have been without it. Here comes the but. This time frame is also probably the loneliest period of my life. I was never the most outgoing toddler. I've always been shy as a kid, but after the lockdowns were lifted, my social anxieties and distrustfulness became unignorable. Although this past year I've grown loads in that regard, I still find it a little hard to relate to people. And a popular phrase I've been told is that I find it hard to let them in. Postmodernity is a moment in history characterized by individuals. If what Dietzgen and Hegel said is true, in that the universal, the whole, is the truth, then in postmodernity, the universal has withered into particulars. The whole has broken down into parts. As multinational capitalism decenters culture, the individual becomes the predominant worldview. I am me, and you are you, and due to the language stuff and the social media death of truth stuff that I mentioned earlier, I am imprisoned within my own subjective castle, and you are too in yours. Of course, the subject I and you don't exist anymore, but bleh. Unlike in the earlier modernist and pre-modernist societies, under this alienated world, I must tolerate you, as you must me, for there is no truth. I have my opinions, and you have yours. I can criticize yours, and you can mine, but it doesn't really matter, does it? As said before, life has become a flurry of meaningless images for us to absorb and pass on as memes. What are these opinions, if not more of these meaningless images? Interpersonal connections in such a world becomes difficult. Not because we're so caught up in updating profile pictures to notice that we haven't updated our shirts in four weeks or some regressive understanding of how social media affects us. Instead, because within postmodernity, within a social ideology that views society as an accumulation of individuals, that views every voice just as unimportant and true as another, that flinches at the hint of narratives, life feels like a disorientating and often overwhelming vortex of words and images. An exhausting spiral that leads nowhere. Like in Serial Experiments Lane. The thing with interpreting Serial Experiments Lane is that you see yourself in it. Obviously that holds true for all art interpretations, but especially so with Serial Experiments Lane because that is the point. Lane is painted as socially anxious. Her visions often include situations that those of us who find a random person's gaze more terrifying than all other monstrosities that the world of horror media has conjured up will relate to as being nightmares. I can't begin to convey how much I relate to Lane as she travels deeper into the wired, how her dad's concerns are vocalized to her, and how her friends try to reel her back to reality, and especially how she counters with the claim that the difference between the wired and the real world is practically non-existent. She's right. Whenever I see people exclaim, THE WIRED IS THE INTERNET! I can't help but almost cringe because throughout the whole show, she's been telling us how The Wired is the real world. The Wired, the internet, is a vortex of disorientating images and sounds and other signifiers that are depthless and meaningless. 
in it identity means nothing because there is no objective center through which you can evaluate yourself from therefore what you think you are and what other people think you are and what you think other people are are all isolated opinions that don't mean anything that do not result in any further discussion or understanding and only leads to apathetic tolerance Every episode of Lane, aside from the last, starts with the same few shots. Nightlife in the streets of a city, the traffic lights, the silhouettes of people walking and talking, groups of circular colors representing faraway traffic. What are these if not a set of rules and signifiers the same way the internet is a set of rules and signifiers? Oh, okay, so that's how it works. I had no idea the world was this simple to figure out. I was overthinking things all along. I always thought the world was such a big, scary place to live in, with no place to hide. But no, once you figure it out, it's all so easy. She's right when she says that the wired and the real world are merging, because this is also what the real world has been since the Second World War. There is no narrative to centralize our lives around after the nightmares of the war showed us that Doing so, whether that be the idea of scientific progress leading to everything good and nothing bad, or the idea of genetic superiority leads to some of the worst periods in the history of humanity, and thus the so-called real world never did have a substantial difference from the internet. It too is a system of signifiers that don't mean anything. The digital age, the internet only amplified this aspect of life to the extent where it is no longer ignorable. And the anime serial experiments lane itself is a great proof for this condition. As said earlier, analyzing serial experiments lane leads us to confront the fact of postmodernity for ourselves. Lane may be interpreted as gay, neurodivergent, socially anxious, or none of these, or all of these. She may be schizophrenic, and all of the show might have just been in her head, or the show could have been a metaphor for the importance of love and human connection. Each interpretation is equally true and adds to the group of truths that Serial Experiments Lane itself renders explicit within its story. In this sense, Serial Experiments Lane is the experiment, and you are the lab rat. How you interact with the show is what the experiment is about. Do you go over to YouTube and search for Serial Experiments Lane Ending Explained as a desperate plea for a unified center to base your understanding around like a fake god Aerie? Or do you interpret it for yourself and become a true god like Lane? A god that exists everywhere and yet nowhere. I am from India, specifically Kerala, one of the southernmost states of the country. I come from a progressive-minded middle-class family and thus I was privileged enough to access the internet to the extent I had. The thing with India is that to say it's just as postmodern as the West would be wrong. India, until 1947, was a colony of the British. As such, the capitalist development that India experienced was half forced upon it by the Brits who obviously never cared about the colonized. And similar to most colonies, nationalism grew within the people as a response to their exploitation. I remember being taught in my 10th grade history class how nationalist activists and leaders commonly readjusted history to unearth cultural richness within India. Look at all the great stuff we Indians have done. The problem is, of course, that there was no India before the British. It's a vast conglomeration of hugely diverse cultures and communities that used to be fragmented kingdoms before the colonizers arrived. I'm not saying that this reassessing of history is a purely bad thing as I didn't live back in those days and I'm very glad that I don't live in a fully colonized country, or at least not an overtly colonized one. But what I am getting at is that this almost forced nationalism, this 
erection of a central idea of India is a grand narrative that dominates Indian culture, although we can significantly due to global capitalism. What this means is that although India is getting more and more postmodern by the day, as it is impossible not to, it still maintains a modern tendency for looking for a center. My peers while growing up, even the people I've gotten close enough to call friends, aren't the same products of the internet that I am. They did not grow up on the internet due to a social conservatism that labels the internet as a morally bad force. This social and cultural conservatism stemming from the very same modernist tendency to hold on to a precarious center. We're seeing the consequences of this tendency in real time as supremacist thought takes a hold of the country and its religious majority, and as they are reflected upon political policies being made. I mention all this here in this video about the anime serial experiments lane in order to tell you that I too am a lab rat of the show. What I found most relatable in the show was Lane's relationship with others around her. Others who have not been engulfed by the wired, who still hold on to the idea of a real world separate from the wired, who still believe in a grand narrative. I too, like Lane, feel alienated by my peers and teachers who seem not to realize that the floor atop which they stand has disappeared. This can only happen, by this I mean seeing yourself reflected in art, if we take a post-structural and decentered approach to art interpretation. And that can only happen in a world that is post-modern. Serial Experiments Lane, as I explained in the beginning section of this video, is simply a system, a grid of signifiers of known images such as that of a schoolgirl, the family, and so on. Lane has no hidden message to give you other than the fact that it has no message to give you. That is, like all art and like all of postmodern life, it is a schizophrenic storm of spectacles and truths. Part 4. Please could you stop the noise? I'm trying to get some rest. Okay, so what do we do from here? Am I saying that there is no truth and that there is only subjective truth, but also none of that? Because the subject also does not exist and therefore all there is are institutions and power except that also does not exist because power does not exist and nothing exists. Yes. Well, no. Well, I do think that postmodernism to a significant extent is responsible for revealing the underlying assumptions that infected most popular ways of thought. And while I do think it is responsible for liberating us in the ways in which we have understood life and society, ultimately buying into this epistemological void where you can't believe in anything ever is a tricky position to take. Detachment is a 2011 sad boy film starring sad boy face man Adrian Brody as a substitute teacher named Henry Bartz in a struggling school. The film opens with an absurdist Camus quote about detaching oneself from the world's apathy towards one so as to confront the absurd nature of existence and party at the end of the universe. And in the film itself, Henry portrays this detached absurdist who, although cares about his dying grandfather and a teenage prostitute he decides to help, still holds on to a degree of detachment towards the misery he perceives in the world, exemplified in an earlier scene where a student in an attempt to intimidate Henry throws his bag at the wall, to which Henry responds, That bag, it doesn't have any feelings. It's empty. I don't have any feelings you can hurt either, okay? There is nothing inside me. I am a sad boy. The world Henry inhabits is one entrenched in misery. Apathetic teenagers and their even more apathetic parents, underage prostitutes, schools being defunded, old patients being treated with neglect and so on. The film, although does not address any of these issues in a constructive, action-oriented way, 
provides a masterful expression of what it is like to live in such a confusing, absurd world. I've flirted with absurdism before on the channel. And it's not just me. Trendy pop philosophical terms like existentialism, stoicism, and absurdism that strictly provide us with a way of approaching the question of what is the meaning of life? perhaps defines the middle-class teenage understanding of philosophy and theory. And look, I liked detachment. I genuinely did. I think it's good not to be lost to ubiquitous assimilation, instead to educate oneself and understand how dominant systems of control frame and manipulate our thought processes. Do I think the education system as it is now will be able to achieve it? Hell no! But do I agree with the general idea? Yeah. But, yet still, detachment troubles me. It ends with Henry sitting alone in his classroom, now in disarray, reading the opening part of Edgar Allan Poe's The Fall of the House of Usher. I know not how it was, but with the first glimpse of the building, a sense of insufferable gloom pervaded my spirit. As he reads the gloomy prose that describe the empty, cold, and dim house of Usher, the camera goes over the piles of open books, now discarded, toppled chairs, torn off pages that cover the empty, peopleless hallways of the school, finally stopping at Henry in his classroom. The film, I think, idealizes misery and suffering. It elevates sadness to a great idea or a feeling that is detached from any material condition. The school's being defunded and the teachers are all getting laid off? Well, that's life. Kids are stupid asshats? Well, that's life. Confused, alienated, and depressed teen kills herself? That's life, innit? The original Metal Gear Solid, after the riding off into the sunset part, Right before the credits roll, three pieces of text show up on screen about how, although after the Cold War, the amount of nuclear warheads in the world were reduced, even in 1998, the time when the game came out, there were still thousands of dangerous nuclear warheads in storage globally. This concern, this sense of urgency towards the regulation of war material and a sharp skepticism towards the shadowy workings of the military underlies the entire plot of MGS-1. I find this very interesting because no matter how much we may go on about the death of truth and the death of subjecthood and how nothing's real, those nuclear warheads that Kojima found concerning were real enough for him to make a whole ass video game surrounding their existence. Everything remains just as true as every other thing, nothing is objectively true anymore. Yeah, that may be the case, but Arisu's heartbeat, even though what it signifies may be up to the subjective interpretation of the viewer, was material, was there. The blood that flows through our veins and the warmth of another's touch are things that, although are signifiers, although may not mean anything, are still there, still exist. Sure, I can't prove it, I don't think anyone can, but does it matter? Detachment, in my frank O, perversely abstracts suffering from their material causes. It locks this greater-than-thou misery atop an ivory tower away from the material conditions that cause them. And this is what I find most troubling about postmodernist theory. Of course, you can call me a cuck meta-narrativist, but I'm sorry, dude, I don't think I need to prove why the death of thousands of children in Gaza is something worth fighting against. Look, while I think postmodernist thought helps us to grasp the pitfalls in many popular schools of thought, it does not need to imply the death of history. Postmodernist philosopher Friedrich Jameson, for instance, holds that, quote, 
it is safest to grasp the concept of the postmodern as an attempt to think the present historically in an age that has forgotten how to think historically in the first place. Jameson believes that although Marxism is a meta-narrative, it is a meta-narrative that's useful to adopt unlike other meta-narratives. It does not really claim to know the entire truth of the universe. Quote, in the case of economic categories, as in the case of every historical and social science, it must be borne in mind that as in reality, so in our mind, the subject, in this case, modern bourgeois society, is given, and that the categories are therefore but forms of expression, manifestations of existence, and frequently but one-sided aspects of this subject, this definite society. In other words, to think that the concepts and categories we use to understand the world do not actively shape our understanding of it is a one-sided position. Marx had to have realized that what we call reality is to a certain extent, of course not to the extent that post-structuralists hold it, a conceptualized reality. In other words, a dialectical materialist view of reality acknowledges that what we know as reality is not the full picture. Furthermore, as the dialectical materialists argue, what every single relation in history, that is, everything, always already contains within it, what it was and what it could possibly be. In other words, your past and your future are all already an internal part of what it means to be you. But, obviously, we can never know our future. Yes, we can predict it by analyzing the tendencies that we can see now, but if you don't take a one-sided and deterministic view of the world, instead opt for a dialectical view, you will realize that the future is utterly contingent. That something so utterly new can and has happened. Therefore, dialectical materialism, which is a fancier and sometimes safer way of saying Marxism, acknowledges that truth, absolute whole truth, cannot be fully known. However, remember those contingent utterly new futures? They don't pop up by themselves, do they? They don't fall out of a coconut tree. People, living, breathing human beings, create these conditions. Perhaps Marx's most popular quote is applicable here, now more than ever. Quote, The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. So, in that sense... Sons of Liberty ends up being more postmodern than what is suggested in the beginning. Faith, now no longer an individualist hyper-subjective force, but a collective one, is what we need. Not a faith that retires you to a passive interpretive coma, but a faith that inspires activity, despite all the death of subjectivity, the death of truth, and the death of reality. Less of you decide your destiny and more of we decide ours. Nothing. Can I ask you something? Who am I, really? I wouldn't know. But we're going to find out together, aren't we? Oh. Uh, yeah. That's it. That's the video. Thank you very much to the users named Abs and Key for becoming members of my Patreon. The link is in the description down below. Consider becoming a member to get access to perks such as name shoutouts at the end of each video, early access to projects, and loads of other stuff that I plan to do in the future. So yeah, once again, thank you Abs and Key for your support. I really, really do appreciate it. Subscribe to the channel for more long videos on video games and anime and stuff. Uh, follow me on Twitter because I post there sometimes and uh, look out for another video in um, a few weeks, probably, Ho hopefully. Uh, yeah, that, that's, that's it. Uh, see you in the, in the Wired, or well, the Wired is just real life, so um, 
uh, I, I won't be seeing you in real life. That's... Mm, mm, mm. 